I like coming to Thanksgiving dinner with an empty stomach. Hungry. No snacks. No appetizers. Not a single carrot stick. Because nothing says thank you for food like an empty stomach. Like a good hunger. When I was 19, I moved out of my apartment because I wanted to save money. I wanted to live as cheaply as possible. So I got a van. I got this beautiful RV, you might want to call it, 68 Chevy van, and I decided I could live in this at the end of the summer and live on cereal for a couple of weeks. Cold cereal, live on just the end of the summer. And think how much money I'd save. It would come late November. I was still in the van and almost out of money. It was the 70s. I couldn't explain exactly what happened, but I was about broke, still in my van in November, and this was Duluth, Minnesota. How many of you have been to Duluth, Minnesota? Can I see your hands? A lot of hands up. Isn't it a beautiful place to be in the summer? How many of you have been there in November, late November? Can I see your hands? Less hands. Well, I have a high regard for you because that is where all the men are strong. <laughs> Women are good looking, children above average, but they got to be there in the winter too. And so, this is Duluth, Minnesota. I wake up one morning, and so for all of you who are there, just so you know, this is across the street from um, Leif Erickson Park right along Bob Dylan Way, it's called now, in the parking lot of my old apartment. And I wake up one morning and it's almost zero, between zero and 10 degrees. From under my blanket, I could see my breath. And the only thing that got me out from under my pile of blankets was a deep 19-year-old hunger. And I made my way out from under those blankets and I poured my granola into a bowl and took my container of milk and went to pour in that and I looked inside and it was frozen solid and my stomach was just just squeezing together with emptiness and I was very early in my health food days so the uh, appeal of just chewing on dry granola was very limited so I was hungry thankfully my best friend had invited me to his family's house for Thanksgiving dinner this isn't a picture of the actual dinner but pretty similar and I took my hunger there and I ate I ate till I was filled with fullness Filled with fullness. Have you been that full? Well, there is not a molecule of space left within your being. You know what that feels like? Yeah. Nothing says thank you for that like a good hunger. Well, later, a few years later, I felt another kind of hunger. Another kind of hunger not so easily filled. After a prophecy seminar, I was hungry to share the bread of life, the gospel, with somebody, to tell them to witness for Jesus, the truth about him. I heard all kinds of stuff, but I was filled to the full with this stuff, and I wanted to go share it with others, like I mentioned last week. But have you ever heard that saying, sharing the gospel is like one beggar telling another beggar where to find bread. You heard that saying? And I found quickly that the problem was that the other beggars didn't seem to be hungry. No hungry beggars but me. So, the idea is that you can be filled to fulling and have good food, good spiritual food, and be hungry to share it and yet suffer in that desire, suffer in that desire to share the gospel. Timothy, 2 Timothy, 
1, 4 says, Therefore do not be ashamed of the testimony or the witness about our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, but share in suffering for the gospel by the power of God. Notice testimony about God is connected with suffering for the gospel. We can suffer, we share in our suffering when we want to share the gospel. We share suffering with Jesus, for one. In Luke 8, you know the story when Jesus found a tormented man, filled with demons, naked, living among the tombs, and he heals him. The town, the crowd, the, the, um, the region comes to see what happened. And they find the man sitting clothed. This man was probably pretty famous. If we had somebody living in a, in the, they say between here and where I live is a, a, a cemetery. If there was a man running around naked, crazy in that cemetery, I think the town would probably know. Well, back then, apparently, he wasn't arrested, but it seems like he was because he kept breaking his chains. Nobody could hold him, so they let him live out there in the cemetery. So he was pretty famous. That's, I think, why everybody went to see. What happened here? So they come out to see this man sitting clothed in his right mind, feeding on the bread of life at the feet of Jesus. And so they plop themselves down right beside him and say, feed me this bread. No, that is not how it goes. What do they do? What do they say? Leave, Jesus, go away. You are disrupting business as usual around here. You are expensive. The crowd was not hungry for the bread of life. So we share with Jesus' suffering when we want to share the truth, the good news, the gospel with others and suffer rejection by people who aren't interested. So we share with Jesus. We share suffering uh, also with Isaiah. In chapter 6, we are pretty familiar, I've heard this preached a few times, you know, where Isaiah is telling other people, basically sharing the bread of life, it seems, telling other people about Jesus. Woe is you, woe is you, and woe is you. And then he gets a good glimpse of himself, and he says what? Woe is me. I'm a man undone, destroyed in the original, destroyed by this glimpse of the purity and goodness of God. And then he takes hold of, he receives that forgiveness we associate with the gospel. And then what happens? The very next thing, after he receives that goodness, Isaiah 6, 8, Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? And I said, Here I am. Send me. So notice how closely connected that forgiveness, that experience of gospel forgiveness is connected to his desire to go and share it with others. But then, notice the next verse. God says, go and tell this people, be ever hearing, but never understanding. Be ever seeing, but not perceiving. And he goes on to say more of the same in the next verse. In other words, go tell these people who aren't going to listen. Go tell these people. He's not saying, don't you dare listen. He's saying, it's kind of a rhetorical statement or facetious or sarcasm. Go and tell these people who won't listen. So what? Why would God tell, tell them to go and tell Isaiah to go and preach to people the good news when he knows they won't listen? A couple of verses down the line, it's because there is a remnant. There are a few precious individuals who will listen. The crowd in general, no. They will hear the words, but not feel the power, not believe in the power of those words. They will miss out, in other words. So if you share with, uh, share suffering with trying to share the gospel, 
can share with Isaiah. So don't give up just because a few people will be listened and the majority won't. And those few can be far between. We can share in suffering with Stephen, you know, the first martyr, who gave a powerful witness for God in Acts 7, full of faith, it says, and power and the Holy Spirit. And as he witnessed, he even had that glimpse of God in heaven. And their response was, wow, that is fantastic. Tell me more. No, what was their response? They stoned him. The root word for witness in Scripture is the same root word as martyr. He was a powerful witness. And Scripture records, though, that there was one who listened. One listened. What did it matter? God, how would you allow Stephen to go through that for just one little witness? One person who would receive what he had to share, that bread of life, and it didn't come easy. Of course, I'm talking about Saul, who would later become Paul, writer of half the New Testament, winner of countless souls, we'll only know in heaven. And it could all be traced to Stephen and his witness, who suffered without any evidence that anyone heard. Can you imagine? I imagine Stephen, either in the resurrection going up or in the in heaven, his first glimpse of of Paul. I imagine he does a double take and then smiles because his witness was worth it. So don't give up because the majority won't listen. Acts 3, uh, Acts 11.24 connects the spirit with witness power where Barnabas is, ta- is told to be full of the Holy Ghost and much people were added to the Lord. So it does happen. Sometimes you do have a, a large group of people respond. Um, but either way, the source is the most important thing. The source is what or who? The source of our witness has to be God. Either way, whether one responds or no one responds or many respond, it has to be, the source has to be God. As in our uh, our, uh, scripture reading for today brings out, Therefore do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, Paul says, but share in suffering for the gospel by what? The power of God. Don't even try it without the power of God, though I personally have, and I'm sure many of you have, because we didn't understand how to do that, how that even, how that worked. How did it work? The stories of Stephen and Barnabas uh, more specifically trace their witness power to being filled with the Holy Spirit. We often associate being filled with the Holy Spirit with our personal selves. We have this God-shaped hole in our hearts that we want to be filled with God's Spirit, but we're not connecting it to the witness power that will come with it. At least I didn't. The stories of Stephen and Barnabas draw attention to this source specifically of the Holy Spirit. Ephesians Ephesians, Paul prays, having experienced it himself, he prays that God would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might by his spirit specifically in the inner man and to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge that you might be what? Filled with all the fullness of God. How is that even possible? You, me, individually, filled with with all the fullness of what? God. Now, wait a minute. Didn't God create the universe? Seems kind of like he'd be pretty big, a lot bigger than me. 
Yet, Paul is praying that we would be filled with all the fullness of God. How does that work? Well, the one little glimpse that I can think of in my own experience is when I'm going through the refrigerator and I'm on think I'm full, but I'm looking for that thing that I'm hungry for, but I don't know what it is. Have you been there? What is it that I'm looking for? I, I don't know. And I so I'll eat this, and I'll eat some of that, and some of this, and you know, it's just not satisfying. Pretty soon I'm so full, I can't eat any more, but I'm still not satisfied. And what I trace it to is sometimes we try to fill that place that only God can fill with physical food. I want to fill this thing and it doesn't work. Not even Thanksgiving dinner will fill that place inside that the fullness of God belongs. He wants us to be filled with the fullness of God and more. That's not enough think it would be enough, the fullness of God, but it's not enough. Look at John 37, 38, and 39. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of what? Living water. What's that symbol of? Holy Spirit, God. Now this he said about the what? The Spirit. Spirit of who? of God, this fullness, being filled with all the fullness of God, even more so that it overflows as a witness to those around us. God wants me, wants us, to be filled with the fullness of His Spirit till it overflows to others like living water. Give me this water. Give me this living water, said the woman at the well. And the fact that she brought the rest of the town out to meet Jesus is pretty good evidence that He answered her prayer. Overfilling on Thanksgiving dinner makes me miserable. For a few hours, it doesn't go well. I do not like it. And I'm not much good to anybody else. You know, I'm sure, hopefully most of us have learned that lesson, but no matter how good the food is, if you keep eating pretty soon, you go past the point that it feels good. You might even, I don't know why, we still do it anyway sometimes, but I remember dragging myself out to, from the Thanksgiving dinner table to 20 feet to get to the couch where I laid there and watched TV, sports, for hours, hoping to feel better in time so I could eat supper. (laughs) So I can tell by laughter that you've been there. Filled to overfull with food doesn't really result in much good. But filled to overfill with the Spirit, now that's something different flows out to others in powerful witness. So, I want to quote from uh, Great Controversy, page 70. The Spirit of Christ is a missionary spirit. The very first impulse of the renewed heart is to bring others also to the Savior. Having a hard time witnessing? Ask for the Spirit. She did. Luke 11, 13 If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, imagine we're thinking about that right about this time of year as we're heading toward Christmas. If you've got children or grandchildren, trying to think, how what are we going to get them that really will be a blessing, not too loud? That's what I'm thinking anyway. You who know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more... Will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Ask for his Spirit. I told you last week I was a lousy witness for Christ. Came to Christ, pushed it on others, didn't result in any good, didn't win anybody, including my family, who I was trying so hard. But it did not work, as I told you last week. 
But when I got serious about daily studying his word and praying and asking for his Holy Spirit, and I have done for years every morning, every morning, things started to happen. I became a pastor, but I had a hard time with sermons. I'd fast and I'd pray all week and I would put hours, I would put 40 hours, I would do other ministry, but I would be up late and up early and skipping meals and just wringing my hands over, this is gutter, and I'd be praying for the people I'm talking to and praying for myself and claiming promises and I'd get up there and I'd share a sermon and I just was not satisfied. And uh, this is the the first few weeks. I've been an associate where my senior pastor let me preach about twice in a year and a half, and then now I'm on my own. I got about 120 people there listening to me preach, and I'm partway through this sermon, but inside I've got this dialogue going on. This is a terrible sermon. I, I am a terrible preacher. When I get down from here, that's it. I am putting in my notice, and I am quitting. And I meant it. So this is going on in my head while outside of my mouth is coming some sermon talk. And then that's done, and I go to the door to see people on their way out. And these two um, ladies I didn't recognize stopped. And uh, one of them has tears just streaming down her face and she doesn't speak English so she speaks to this lady with her as an interpreter and what she says is I uh, I don't uh, understand English Uh, I came here thinking this was a Spanish church we're from another country and I thought this was a Spanish church so we came here and I understood every word you said and it's exactly what I needed and now when you're looking into the eyes of somebody who's got tears coming down them and the interpreter tells you that, well, I can tell you I didn't quit. I did not quit, obviously, as you know. But the point is, I didn't have this ecstatic euphoria as I was preaching, but I had a similar experience as, as they did at Pentecost, where their spirit was poured out. Acts 1.8, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my, my witnesses. So there's this lady, I'm looking into her, into her eyes and I'm like, whoa, now clearly the Spirit was working here. And my takeaway is that verse does not just apply to the early and latter rain. It applies to us today. God's Spirit is available to you and I to fill us. The Holy Spirit is the essential ingredient in a powerful witness. Cannot do without it. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come and you will be my witnesses, says who? says the Lord. Sometimes people won't respond. Even when you're filled with the Holy Spirit, they didn't respond to Jesus. He was filled with the Holy Spirit and yet despised and rejected. Church leaders dogged him, criticized him. He worked with his disciples for three and a half years and they still weren't ready. Why should we think it would be easy for us? Even on the cross, hungry and thirsty and so exhausted, yet even in that suffering, he continued to witness or testify or exemplify the love of God, the Spirit of God. He allowed his arms to be spread out and nailed to a cross because that's what it would take for you and I to have the possibility to be filled with the fullness of God, that it would overflow and reach out to those around us as living waters. That's what it took. Some won't respond, no matter how loving and kind and spirit-filled we are. But I'm thankful 
he didn't give up. At the end of the whole world, at the end, the whole world will follow after the beast, except for a select group, those who have selected to ask for that spirit, to be filled, those who will keep the commandments of God and the testimony, witness of Jesus. Out of them, the spirit will overflow to people as the best possible witness. That's the experience that I want to have. I don't know if people will listen or not, but I want to be so filled with his spirit that I will be the best possible witness that I can be. Acts of the Apostles 600 says, there is nothing that the Savior desires so much as people who will re- represent to the world his spirit. There is nothing that the world needs so much as a manifestation through humans of the Savior's love. All heaven is waiting for men and women through whom God can reveal the power of Christ. That's my, that's my challenge to you, to myself, from heaven itself. All heaven is waiting for people that will yield, will receive that spirit, will ask, will study and pray and receive what he longs to give. 